dealing with these seven steps down to the hog pen. We've been in this series for several weeks now, and uh, and so I've enjoyed it. And I uh, don't know if anybody else has enjoyed it, but I have. So uh, if you didn't, just keep the comments to yourself, and uh, we'll be all right. So, uh, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this, and uh, enjoyed getting into it. And so we're going to be dealing with uh, these seven steps once again. We're actually on the seventh step, and uh, we're going to be dealing with this seventh step once again. We started last Sunday in this seventh step down to the hall tent, and so uh, we're going to deal with it once again. And so uh, if you have your place, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, we're going to be in verse 11 down through verse 24. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 down through verse 24. So when you find your place, if you would, we're going to stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word this morning. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, down to verse 24, says these words. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be married. Seven steps down to the hog pen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. And Lord, we ask you this morning, help us as we open up your word. Lord, help us, God, to center in on what you'd have us to see and hear. I pray, Father, that we won't allow any distractions to, to distract us away from seeing and doing, dear God, what you'd have us to do this morning. Father, I just ask you to do a mighty work in our hearts. I pray that today, God, that if there's one lost today in this sanctuary, Lord, that they'd be saved. I ask you, God, to do that. Save them before it's too late. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the great privilege, the great honor to be able to preach. And, Lord, to be able to hear your word being spoken. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Seven steps down to the hog pen. We didn't get the grunts this morning. I don't know where the grunts were. But we usually have some uh, some grunts for the uh, hogs when I come up here. But uh, anyhow, uh, I like the grunts. Seven steps down to the hog pen. Well, there it is. All right. Well, we can start it now. All right. Seven steps down to the hog pen. All right. Now, when we think about the hog pen, nobody in their right mind would ever say, I want to end up in a hog pen. I want to end up eating slop that the hogs eat. Nobody in their right mind would say that they would love to end up there. You know, if you ask young people in their life, what do you want to be when you grow up? Everybody will tell you they want to be a lawyer, they want to be a doctor, they want to be a preacher, they want to be a, a teacher, they want to be uh, all these different things. They want to be something great, something that they inspire to be great. But nobody, when you ask them when they're young, do you ever want to be in a hog pen when you grow up? 
Nobody would say that they'd rather want to be there. Nobody would ever say that. That's where I would love for my life to end up in a hog pen eating slop that the, that the pigs eat. Nobody in their right mind would say that. But I guarantee you, if we went across this sanctuary, everybody in here could tell you at least one person, maybe in their family or one friend that they know of, that their life has ended up in the hog pen. Maybe some of you that's sitting here this morning can say, hey, I have been in the hog pen in my life. I remember a time in my life where that was a place where I ended up in, and let me tell you, I never want to go back to it ever again. We know people that have been in hog pens. We know people even right now that are in the hog pen. We know that they are suffering. They're going through some hard times, and they're there. They're eating the slop that the pigs eat, and they're in the hog pen. So how in the world did they end up there? How do we as men and women in this place that's got good minds and good bodies end up in the hog pen? I shared with you several of these steps, and I'm just going to go over them. You can uh, look on Facebook and YouTube and everything else where we have our, our videos where millions of people have viewed them, and so you can watch it as well. <laughs> Some of y'all are not listening fast enough this morning, all right? <laughs> If we got a million views, it'd be amazing, all right? Yes, I think my mom is the only one that ever views my videos on YouTube. So uh, if, if she's the only one, it's all right. I enjoy it anyway, all right? Seven steps. The first step we dealt with was desire. When you have a wrong desire, when you start desiring things that God doesn't desire, you start ending up and heading towards the hog pen. Desire. Many of us can testify in our lifetime, we have had times in our life where we've desired the wrong things. We've desired the wrong things. And so that leads us to the second thing is not only desire, but then we'll have wrong decisions. When we have a wrong desire, we'll start making wrong decisions. Remember this, stinking thinking produces stinking living. When you have wrong desires, you'll start making wrong decisions. And you're closer to the hog pen when you have those two steps. So you have a desire, then you have a decision. But then thirdly, we talked about departure. You see, when you start making wrong decisions and you start having wrong desires, you'll start departing away from the truth. You'll start getting as far away from God as you possibly can. You'll start departing from the fellowship of believers. You'll start, instead of coming on Sunday and Wednesday and getting a, a hold of God and getting a part of God and saying, I want to be with God's people and I want to love on God's people. I want to fellowship with God. Instead, you'll start sinning on missing on Wednesday. You'll start sinning on missing on Sunday. And then the next thing you know, you'll start sinning on missing like months at a time. And then the FBI couldn't even find them after a while. You see, they are constantly on the process of heading down to the hog pen because of departure. They start leaving and getting away from God as far as they can. That's what this young boy did in this passage of scripture, the prodigal son. Says that he went to a far country. He got away from his father, as far away from his father as he possibly could. He departed. So you have a wrong desire. You have a wrong decision. You start departing. And then fourthly, deception. Satan will start deceiving you. He'll start showing you that, hey, the world is where you need to be. You need to live it up. You need to do all that you can. But he fails to tell you the end result. He deceives you, and he brings deception in your life. I've seen people, they get deceived. They start thinking, well, I'm making more money for my family, and my family needs it. They need the money. No, your family needs you to get a hold of God. Yeah. And they need you to be faithful to God. They need you to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your body. You need to love God because yeah. that's the greatest commandment that God said that we should do. Love him. So we need to love him. We don't need more money. We don't need more things, more materialistic stuff. We just need God, folks. But Satan will tell you, you need more things to make you happy. You need more money to make you happy. You need success to make you happy. No, you don't. The only thing you need in life to make you happy is God. God and nothing else. He'll bring happiness to your life. So we see... Those four steps. And then the fifth step we talked about was defeat. You'll be defeated. You will be defeated. Now, nobody likes being defeated. 
I can testify to that. I hate being defeated. When I played sports, I hated to lose. If you're going to play, play to win. I can't stand these people saying, well, we just, we just play to have fun. Huh, no, no. No, we don't. We play to win. That's the reason why I practice all week long, because I'm going to go out there and I'm going to win. I don't want to lose. Losing is not fun. Being defeated is not fun. I remember my senior year. We were uh, great. We were ranked number one in the nation in college, and uh, we had a phenomenal team. We went into playoffs. We were whipping people. I mean, just beating them left and right. We were number one going into the last game of the season, national championship. It was actually seen by ESPN as one of the greatest games of the century. It went into four overtime with Northwest Missouri State. We played them the year before. They beat us in the national championship the year before, but not this year. Man, we was going to go out there and whoop them. Went into four overtime. We were up two touchdowns with two minutes left to go in the regular game. And they come back. And our guy going in to score a touchdown, fumbled. We lost the national championship. We had the greatest team probably uh, that our college has ever had. And we fumbled going into it to win. To be the national champions. We lost that day. Can I tell you that I have watched that video sparingly? I don't even like to talk about that that day. Because we lost. We lost something that we have strived to have. We wanted a national championship. We wanted to be victorious. We wanted to be a champion. But we lost it. I hate losing. Can I tell you this much? If you start having wrong desires, you start making wrong decisions, you start to get away from God, and Satan starts deceiving you, you're going to start being a loser. Amen. And you'll be defeated every single time. And you'll be closer to the hot team because he's going to defeat you. But then that leads me to the sixth thing. And that is despair. Despair. Now nobody wants to be in a time of despair. But it will bring you to that place of despair in your life if you're not careful. Heading down to the hog pen. And then last week we got into what we talked about and that was desperation. Desperation. That seventh step. Heading to the hog pen. Is desperation. Now I talked with you last week about desperation and I shared with you just one thing that desperation does to our lives. And that is it brings isolation. But this week I want to share with you just a couple more things about what desperation does in our life. If you look with me in Luke chapter 15 verse 13. I want you to look what it says here in chapter 15 verse 13. It says that this prodigal son, it says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. The second thing that desperation does to our lives is that it will cause you not to allow obstacles to hinder you. Desperation in our lives will cause you not to allow obstacles to to hinder you. Now I want to get into this this morning because I think this is very important of what we need to see today. Because I think many people allow obstacles to hinder them of worshiping God. They allow obstacles to hinder them to come to God and live for God and be faithful to God. They allow all these other things in their life to hinder them. But when you get into a time of desperation in your life, you won't allow any obstacle. You won't allow anything to hinder you from coming to God. Here in this passage of scripture, it says that this young man took his journey to a far country. He wasn't just far away from his father. He actually went to a whole different country than where his father was. He wanted to get his way, as far away from, God, uh, from his father as he possibly could. 
But we see here in this passage of scripture, it was in this country that he ended up in a hog pen. It's in this country where he ended up eating the slop that the pigs were eating. It was in this country that he found himself facing obstacles. And he found himself in this hog pen. And it says that he saw that he needed to go back to his father. Look with me in verse 17 and verse 18. Verse 17 says this, and when he, saw, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Then look what he says in verse 18. I will arise and I will go to my father. It is in the hog pen where this boy realized he needed to go back to his father. It was at this moment of desperation that he knew he needed to get back to the father. Some of us here this morning have been in a place of desperation. Where God has tried to get your attention time and time and time again. And you kept avoiding him. You kept basically pushed him to the side and finally God got you to a place of being in a hog pen and he got you to a place of desperation and there it was in that moment that you found yourself saying I need to come back to God I need to go back to the Father this prodigal son you gotta think he lived life to the fullest did he not he spent all of his money on prostitutes, spent all of his money on drinking, spent all of his money on party, spent all of his money on everybody that said that he, they were his friends. But God says, I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to bring you to a place that you thought you would never end up, and it's going to be a place called the hog pen. And I'm going to bring so much desperation to your life that you're going to be so desperate in your life that you're going to see that you got to come back to me. I'm thankful that God sometimes puts us in places where we see that we've got to come back to him. I'm so thankful that he does that because why? He loves us. So desperation, it causes us to not allow obstacles to hinder us. So here in this passage of scripture, it says that the prodigal son says, I need to go back to my father. So now he's in another country. He's living in a hog pen. And he says, I need to go back to my father. Now, this is one thing I, I looked at and I said, you know, there was some obstacles that this boy was going to have to overcome. Because the journey back to his father is going to be a lot harder than the journey away from the Father. How is that? Well, if you look in this passage of Scripture, one of the obstacles that he's going to have to overcome is money. You see, when he left his father, he had all of his inheritance. He had all the money that he could possibly ever want. And it says that he took his journey to a far country. I'm pretty sure it was pretty easy. If he needed a place to stay, I've got money. If he needed some food, I've got money. If he needed anything, I've got the money. I don't need anything. I don't need any help. Don't need God. Don't need nobody else. I've got the money. <laughs> He's at a moment right now where he has spent all of his money. And matter of fact, he doesn't have enough money to even buy food because he's eating in the hog pen. He didn't have money enough to even buy a place to stay. On this journey back to his father. You see when he took this journey. You can imagine. His stomach's going to grab for days of journeys. If he's in a far country. It's going to take him a while to get back to his father. And it says that he was going to take this journey. But he had to overcome the obstacle of money. Didn't have money for food. Didn't have money for shelter. Didn't have money for nothing. This boy was broke. As we all say broke is a joke. That's what this boy was. He didn't have a dime. He didn't have a penny to his name. He was broke. 
He was like me in college, broke. <laughs> Eating ramen noodles. I had more than what that boy had. He was broke, folks. He had no money. He had to overcome the obstacle of money. You're saying, well, what does that have to do with having desperation and coming to God? Oh, let's look at America today. You know the reason why people are not desperate for God today is because of the obstacle of money. As long as we've got money, we have no need for God. We have no desire to trust on God or depend upon God as long as we've got more and more money. But as you can see today, money ain't going to happen. Because you can make a lot of money and still yet, as long as inflation goes up, that money ain't going to worry about nothing else. Because you're going to be broke. But many people today, they get so I guess you want to call it intoxicated with money that they would rather have money than their relationship with God. They'd rather have money than to do what is right in their life. They'd rather just keep making more and more and more. Why? What's, what, why do you want more and more money? Is it a status quo you're trying to reach? Are you trying to just look at people and say, hey, I got the money. I got the money. Well, that's great. You can die tomorrow and it'll all still be here. What's money going to do for you, folks? This young boy is trying to tell us in this story, money is not where it's at. But now he's going to have to overcome the obstacle of money to come back to the Father. Many of us here this morning may can relate to this about money because we have made some great money. And it's caused us to stay away from God. I've seen people, they'll say, well, they're doing double the amount of money if I work overtime on Sunday. You know, the money's good, got to go. The mule's in the ditch, got to go work on Sunday. Money, money, money. It's an obstacle for you, folks. It's hindering you with your fellowship and your relationship with God. It's hindering you because of money. That's all we see, dollar bills. Making more money. Can't come on with it. I work. Got to get that money. Got to work, work, work. Can I tell you something, folks? Money ain't going to satisfy you when you're going to need God. Yes, sir. When your family's in need, what are you going to say? I wish I could buy them out. I wish I could help them. If I could buy a prayer right now, I'd, I'd just send money to it. It ain't going to help. Mm. It ain't going to help. Money ain't going to help, folks. It's an obstacle for us in America. I've heard my dad, we talk about this. We talk about judgment on America. And, uh, and people say, well, well, do you think God's going to judge America soon? And I've heard my dad say, well, he believes that God's already judged America. And I asked him, I said, well, how's that? And he said, through prosperity. As long as you have everything... You'll see no need for God. What greater judgment is that? You see, in America today, folks, we have no need for God. Why? We got enough money. We can buy whatever we want. We can afford anything that we want. We don't need God. We don't have to depend upon God. We don't have to trust God. We got money. This boy lost it all, folks. He's in the hog pen, but he says, I I'm going back to the Father. No matter if I don't have a dime to my name, I'm going to make it back to him. And it says he took his journey with no money. I thought about that journey that he's going to be on. He can't buy food, can't buy shelter. And another thing I saw when he was making this journey, says that no man gave him, that means he didn't have a friend more. He made this journey alone by himself. He had no family members there to walk him back. He had no friends that was there to walk him back. He had no friends to sit there and say, hey, look, buddy, I'm with you. I'm going to help you along. I'm going to help you get back to your father. He had nobody. He was alone. There's many of us here this morning that can testify when we got into that hog pen, 
God put that moment of desperation in our life, we saw ourselves alone by ourselves. No family member around, no friends around. God got us to a place where it was just you and God. And you had to come back to it by yourself. Alone. Can you imagine making this journey from one country to the other and making it alone? You see, he had to overcome these obstacles. Money, shelter, food, loneliness. He had to overcome all that. But you know what? He says he made it back to his father. Why? Because desperation didn't hinder him. Desperation didn't allow him to be hindered by obstacles in his life. You know what he was saying? I would rather go back to my father than have anything this world can ever afford. I would rather have my fellowship, my relationship with my father back again than anything that this world can offer. Yeah. A moment of desperation saying it's not going to allow anything to hinder me to getting back to God. You know the reason why some of us here are not living the way God wants us to live? Because we haven't got to that moment of desperation. Realizing that we need God more than anything in this world. Realizing that He is the answer and nothing else in this world. We have to come to a point of desperation of allowing nothing to hinder us of coming back to God. I thought about a story in the Bible where they come to God, desperate, and wouldn't allow anything to hinder. There's a passage of scripture, if you look with me, in Luke, Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to read it, it's in verse 17 down through verse 20, but it's a story about a man that was paralyzed, and in Luke chapter 5, verse 17 down through verse 20, look what it says, have it on the overhead, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then look what it says. And behold, men brought in a bed, um, in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy, which he was paralyzed. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. Talking about he's going to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Then look what it says in verse 20. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the man, he said, the sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. The story goes on that says that Jesus goes back to the man and he says, take up thy bed and walk. And he did. Here in this passage of scripture, there were some obstacles just like the prodigal son had to overcome. This paralyzed man had to overcome as well. But it was a little bit different than the prodigal son because this man had four men that carried his bed. He had some friends to help him out. And some of you can testify, you've had friends to be there in your desperate need. In the times of desperation, you had people surrounding you saying, hey, I'm here with you. I'm going to help you. And they did. But it says that they came to Jesus and there were so many people around that house and listening to Jesus as he was speaking on the inside of the house. It said they couldn't even see him. They couldn't even get into where he was. That didn't stop them, did it? It didn't hinder them. They said, you know what? We're going to get to him one way or another. Just like that prodigal son, he says, I'm going to go the distance. I'm going to get out of this country. I'm going to go back to my father's country. No matter if I don't have any money, no matter if I don't have no food, water, nothing. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to get back to my father. These friends said, you know what? We're going to get you to Jesus. It says they went on the rooftop. Not just the rooftop. But it says they took the roof off. They took the roof off the man's house. I don't know whose house it was that they were at. But it says it took the roof off and lowered him down to where he was in the midst of Jesus. And it says at his feet. Can I tell you something? They should not be anything that should hinder you enough to keep you away from Nothing in your life should hinder you from doing what God wants you to do. If these 
Jesus' men had faith enough to take a roof off to get their friend down to God, we should do all that we can to get our family members that are not right, to get our friends that aren't right with God, to say, hey, we need to bring them to God. Yeah. You see, if you're completely in that moment of desperation, you'll do whatever it takes to get to God. I think the reason why we don't see a lot of people getting to God because they haven't gotten in that moment of desperation. They haven't come to that point of being in a hog pen, a moment of desperation, realizing they need to come back to God. Yeah. They need to. I want to ask you a question this morning. What's hindering you from being sold out to God? What's hindering you from doing what God wants you to do? What's hindering you? Is it money? Is it work? Why aren't you sold out to God? Why aren't you desperate to see God every day of your life? Why? That's a problem, folks, if you're a child of God. If you're not desperate for God every day, that's a problem in our life. If you're allowing things to hinder your walk and hinder your fellowship with God, that is a problem in a child of God. So what is it that's hindering you and you're allowing it to hinder your fellowship? Many of us have allowed things to come in and block our fellowship with God. We've allowed a lot of I remember after I graduated college, I was saved my senior year in college, April the 16th, year 2000. Going on 24 years, I've been saved now in April. But on April the 16th, year 2000, God changed my heart, changed my life. People told me growing up, said, Spanky, you're going to be a preacher one day. I said, uh, no. If there's one thing I promise you, I will not be, will be a preacher. I've been a preacher's kid all my life. I've seen the ins and outs of churches. Don't want nothing to do with it. I'm fine. But God changed my heart. God changed my desire. And I was saved April the 16th, year 2000. And God started working on my heart to go into ministry. God started really dealing with me. And I had a job coming out of college. I've done had it. I've done been hired. I was getting ready to have this job and to make some good money and then to be able to climb the ladder. That was my desire. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to not be poor. I'm going to be able to have some money. And I remember we was riding down the road right in front of River Falls Golf Course. Me and my dad was in his F-150, a white F-150. I think it was a 97 F-150. The church actually gave it to us. We was riding in this F-150 right there in front of River Falls Golf Course. And as we were riding by, my dad looked at me. I just out of the blue. And he said, Spanky, if I wasn't in the truck, and it was just you and God in the truck, and God looked at you and said, Spanky, what is it that I want you to do for me? What would be your answer? I said, to preach, go in the ministry. And then my dad asked, said the thing to me. Well, why ain't you doing it? And it was at that moment, that day, I said, you're right. I'm going to quit allowing money to hinder me. I'm going to quit allowing my job to hinder me, thinking that I need to make more to be happy. And that was the moment that I said, yes. I'm going to do what God wants me. And not what Spain wants. That's right. God's got a special plan for each and every one of us. He's created us uniquely. We're all different. He's got something great that He has in store for you. But you got to allow nothing to hinder you from following through. 
you're not careful, you'll allow all the things of the world to distract you and hinder you. And it'll become an obstacle in your life that you can't overcome because you've allowed it to hinder you. Can I tell you this morning? Maybe you just need a moment of desperation. Saying, God, I don't care what people may say or what people may think, but God, I'm coming to you no matter what. That's what this prodigal son and this hog he. He's there. He's in the hog pen. He's got his face down at the dirt where the food, the nastiness of the hogs. And it says he came to himself. And he says there's others that are my, my father's servants that eat better than me and they still got bread left over. He says, I am going back to him no matter if I don't have no money, no matter if I don't have a friend, I'm going back to God because he is my answer. It's the father. Can I tell you something, folks? That's what you need. You need to come to a moment of desperation saying, God, I'm tired of living life so miserable. I'm tired of being so empty in my life. I've got more money. I've got more stuff. But God, I'm so filthy. Right. And God, I'm coming to you. Yes. Desperate. Needing you to answer. Folks, the answer is just coming back to God. But don't allow anything to hinder you from giving to him. He is faithful to forgive us if we will just confess our sin to him. He is faithful. So I want to ask you this morning. Are you allowing things to hinder you? Are you allowing obstacles to come in your way of doing what God wants you to do in your life? Or maybe, maybe there's some of you here this morning that says, you know what? I'm just like that prodigal son. I'm in a moment of desperation. I've tried everything, but I'm not satisfied. I've tried everything. I'm still in. I need God. I need Him. Can I tell you? All you got to do is come to Him. All you got to do is cry out to Him. Say, God, I need you. And He's there. Hmm. Would you please stand with me this morning? As God has spoken to our hearts. you're here this morning God has spoke to you and showed you, maybe it's salvation in your life. You've never been saved. Come on. Say, God, save me. I trust what Jesus did on the cross. I believe him. I know he died for me. He rose again on the third day. I believe all that, God. I need you, God. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. If you'll just call out to him. Maybe you're here, you're saved. But you've allowed obstacles after obstacles after obstacles to hinder you from being faithful to God. Hinder you in your fellowship and relationship with God. You've allowed it to hinder you. You've allowed it to come in the way of you just being sold out to God. Once you come around the altar and say, God, here I am. I need you, God. I need you. Just like that song said when our singers were singing, I need you every hour. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come this morning? Take that step. Take that step. Coming back to God. I need you, Lord. I need you. You need God more than money. You need God more than a job. You need God more than fame. You need more than 
possessions. You need God more than all those things. Do you want more than anything? Do you want more than anything? This prodigal son said, I am going to my father. Father God, we uh, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for encouragement, conviction. Father, I ask you just to help us. <coughs> help us, dear God, to not allow anything to hinder us from coming to you and to being faithful. I thank you, God, for your love and mercy. I thank you, God, for forgiveness. Father God, we praise you.